Hey guys, thank you for tuning in to the Risen Nation Church podcast. I pray that this message today impact your life and above all, draw you into a deeper encounter with Jesus. We've been on this theme. I feel like uh, I've been on it for weeks and um, we ended. How many of you remember we, we learned the works of faith a few weeks ago? No one remembers that? It's all right. It's on YouTube. It's okay. Forgive you. But we ended that we ended that message with love is the bond, Colossians chapter three of perfection. And I can't get out of this theme of God's immense, amazing, incredible love. And we heard it Friday night so beautifully from Pastor William. And I just wanna continue in that. Can we do that this morning? And then we're gonna activate it at the end. But I really believe, I told our staff uh, this week during our staff meeting, I said that I've been praying three things over our community. You want to know what they are? That we would have a renewed recognition and revelation of his love for us. Listen, today I'm praying that from third grade to 90 years old that everyone can receive today. So I'm going to use language that we're familiar with, but I'm asking you to please not receive it with your old ears. Like Pastor Landry said, put on new ears for the new year, okay? And receive what the Lord is speaking to us because his love is the deepest, greatest, highest revelation that we could have. There is no other theological revelation. There is no other word that I can give you that is more impactful, that will change us from the inside out until we understand his love. We can only begin actually to understand his love. So I've been praying, number one, and I want you guys to write this down because I want to pray it as a family, that we have a revelation and a renewed recognition of his love for us. A revelation and renewed recognition of his love for us. Next, I've been praying over our community that our love for him would increase. Number two, that our love would increase. And number three, that our love for one another would increase. And all these, you guys got those down? You guys write slow. Penmanship class here. Um, So renewed recognition and revelation of his love for us, that our love for him would increase and that our love for one another would increase. And these are all direct results of each other, right? So you can't love him unless he loved you first, we know. You can't love another unless you love him with all your mind, all your heart, and all your soul. So I can't love you more than I love him. So the level that I love Jesus at is my ceiling is my limit to my love for you. And I can't love him more than he loves me. And so the more revelation of how much he loves me that I receive, the more that I love him. The more revelation and recognition of his immense, unspeakable, glorious, powerful, amazing love for me, the more I can love him. That is not only a decision I make, it is a direct result. It is an instant manifestation of recognizing that is our love for him. That's why when we have altar calls, we, we, in the American church, we've done it such a disservice and and we've, we've called it the sinner's prayer. We call people sinners when we should be having an altar call to come and to accept Jesus. And let me tell you how much he loves you. That'll cause them to love, not telling them they're sinners. We've made it so religious. We've done it so backwards and we've done a disservice to the love of God because we've confined him to a book and our time and events. We're really into time and events and how we think he should come and how we think he loves and how we think he heals. But we need to have this revelation of his love for us today. Amen. Jeremiah 31, two to three, just write it down. It says, thus says the Lord, the people who survived the sword, speaking of the children of Israel and found grace in the wilderness 
Israel when I went to give him rest. Verse three, the Lord has appeared to me of old saying, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Say everlasting. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. And we heard Friday night that that is to drag. And the word that Pastor William used was a, a Greek word. This is a Hebrew word to, to drag. It means the same thing. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Psalms 136.1 in the New Living Translation says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. So when I read this verse, what I've been meditating on, how many of you know it's important that we meditate on the word? That we don't just read in the morning and go throughout our day. Like read, just some practical tips here. Read less so you can meditate more. Because it'll be in here. Don't, you know, you don't need to read seven chapters a day. What are you going to retain from that? Read less, meditate more. Though his, that's Selah. That's what, it's think on these things. Amen? And so I was thinking on his everlasting love. And, you know, I thought of when Chloe was born, my four-year-old. When she came out, she came out purple and screaming and alien-y looking. She was adorable. Do I have, and all the parents can relate, okay? Like, he's the worst parent. All parents can, like, yes, you have a love for them right away, obviously. Like, oh my gosh, this is my child. This is insane. But how many of you can agree that I've had babies and they maybe are toddlers now? You love them a million times now more than when they were born. Like, don't be, okay. don't be religious and weird. Like, I, from the moment they came out, I was, my heart was bursting. Like, Yes, we love them, of course. And I would, at the second she came out, I would die for her, yes. But if you compare four years later, how much I love Chloe compared to when she was born, there's no comparison. See, I'm not talking the religious ones. I'm talking the real ones, okay? There's no, and for those of you that have kids, like you'll leave the hospital more in shock than in love. <laughs> Like your whole life changes going to the parking lot. And then you're like, oh, I got to carry this thing around for the next six years. <sighs> and all the bags. We go to my parents' house. We're there like for 20 minutes. And it's like, we're going on a road trip. The, the van just overflows with bags constantly. 48 changes of clothes and diapers. And I love it. <laughs> but the Lord... He didn't start loving you when he created you. Like we start loving our children when we see them. I mean, you could love them before the idea, but what, you haven't seen them yet, right? So his love is an everlasting love. So from eternity, he's love. And from his place of eternal love, he said, let us make man in our image. And the love that he had was brooding, was moving, hovering, vibrating for expression. And so when you were created, when you were born, you entered into this eternal, uh, this eternal reality of love that you actually become the object of, the expression of the end game for the fulfillment of this immense love of God. Because his love is not based on what you do for me, I'll do for you. His love is not based on when I feel good, you treat me right, you're cute, you're a little baby, and I love you so much. It's not an emotional love. It's a life that you were born into from everlasting. And so we actually, we were created in love. So our origin, our beginning is love. This is, why it'll, this is why it's the only thing that'll change you. It's the only thing that will show us this immense, amazing side of God, that his love is faithful, everlasting, and endures forever. Someone say forever. That's not 80 years of flesh. His love endures forever, Psalm says. I'm gonna break some religion, okay? 
from everlasting to everlasting, I have loved you with an everlasting love. So you just came into what has always been. I didn't love you when I saw you. I didn't love you because you behaved. I didn't love you because of all these prerequisites we put on it. You were born into my eternity, which is love fully expressed, just not in a container. Love red hot needs a, an expression. For those of you that are married, say amen. amen. Love that is burning needs an expression or it's not complete. I could tell my wife I love her, but if I never kiss her, if I never see her, if I never hug her, what difference does it make? What difference does it make if we confess our love, but there's not an expression of it? You are the expression, the end game of the expression of God's love manifest through his son, Jesus. He was the physicality, the physical expression of the love of God. You are love's destination. Thanks, Mom. Praise God. <laughs> <laughs> you are love's destination, capital L. You guys don't look excited. Is, that, is this, this is wrecking me. You are love's destination. Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This word demonstrates means to set together. We've been talking about, Pastor Josh brought a great word last week at the Bible study about we are in the era of assembling the body. That I believe that with all my heart, that we are assembling God's body, that we are coming to a state of perfection, a state of completion, not in a perfection of behavior modification. We are coming into a complete state as the church of God. And we're going to see at the end, but I believe this morning that what the mirror that we are looking in, the word says darkly, dimly, you can kind of see yourself prophesy in part. We understand in part, but when that, which is true comes, when love comes, we will know as we are fully known. And I believe that which is in part is going to be done away with that we may experience the fullness of who God is. Amen. And so he's setting together that the word demonstrates here in Romans 5, 8 means set together to set in the same place to put together. It means a unit part of one whole. That's what you are, a unit part of one whole. So what he's saying is my love was searching for manifestation, searching for expression. And so I set it together with you. I demonstrated my love and that word toward is in you or unto us. So he's saying, I set together my love in you. You guys following this? I set in place, I put together, I assembled, I perfected my love in you that before you could do anything for me, you were actually doing a lot of stuff against me. I gave myself for you. That I died for you. That I gave myself up for you. And I believe the greatest hindrance of love in this hour is self. The greatest restriction of love is self-motivations. And we all have them. Every single person in this room including myself and watching online, we all have them. They're subtle. And it is the in part that I want to get rid of that we may come to the fullness because love must, at the end of love is a giving of something. Love is love in its ability to give. Love is full. Love is perfect. Love is complete in its ability to give. So there is no love if the end of it is not giving. That's why he said, I'm going to demonstrate. I'm going to complete, perfect my love in you because 
as you are sinning against me, coming against me, I'm going to show you that my love is everlasting, not based on your works, not based on your behavior, not based on what you've done, and I'm going to give myself for you. That's the greatest demonstration of love is to give. And so I'm praying that that the Lord raise us up to a higher level, like Pastor Mark shared, a higher place to come up, a higher dimension of thinking, a higher dimension of seeing, a higher dimension of living that leaves self behind. I always get four amens on that one. That leaves motivations, desires. We live in a generation that is completely infatuated with self. And it's not some dirty, nasty thing. Maybe in some cases it is. It's not some horrible sin. I'm not saying people that, that, um, that live by self or have motivations are evil people or doing something. No, it's, it's, it's so subtle. And I believe that the Lord is bringing us to a place of loving one another. And that starts by being more aware of one another. Denying yourself starts with carrying something that's not yours. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13 says, bearing one another in love. And so I believe that we can have, as we heard, this recognition of how God loves us and we can love him with all of our heart, but you can't have, you can't love him unless we love each other. This is the greatest expression we're going to read that you can't say, I love God with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my soul, if you don't love the one next to you. you it's impossible. And so I want us to think about all the, the, the faceted diamond that love is, that every way you look at it, it, looks, it gets more and more beautiful. But love comes with recognition, when we recognize that which we love, it becomes the object of our love. It becomes where love wants to be expressed and I'm gonna give myself to that thing, that person. People really love their dogs and they think about them all the time and they become the object of their love. We forget about our kids, but our dogs, the object of our love. But it's, it takes a recognition. And so I'm praying that that. Are you guys hearing the spirit of what I'm saying? I'm praying that the, the self-motivation, motivation, what is God doing in my life? What is my purpose? What is my calling? What is my gifting? And I believe all that is going gonna, is gonna to begin to be manifest in our community like we heard. I believe that God has given us gifts for the body that the body so desperately needs. But we're going to read in a minute in Numbers 11 how that happens. Amen? Amen. All right. So Numbers 11, and let's start reading in verse 25. So read the whole chapter on your own time. It's kind of uh, comical, well, sort of. Um, the people of Israel are, are complaining and saying, we're sick of this manna. And, you know, we, we had meat and we had lentils and we had onions and garlic. Like we had all these delicacies in Egypt and you take us out here to give us manna. They're complaining about like, he literally gave them himself every single day. They're complaining. And so I pray that complaining is first eradicated. Amen. That's a, a epidemic in the house of God. And they're complaining and they're saying, we don't, we want some meat. And so early in the chapter, the Lord says to Moses, I'm, I'm going to give them not meat for one day, two days, five days, 10 days, 20 days, but I'm going to give them meat for a whole month and it's going to come out of their nostrils and it's going to become loathsome to them because they have despised the Lord. So you want some meat? I'll give you some meat. And then Moses has this experience with God where he's like, Lord, I'm just so sick of these people. Just kill me, please. <laughs> You see the travail of God and Moses for these, over these people. In verse 25, so, before, I'm sorry, before we start reading, I'm trying to give you the background here. And so, as Moses is praying to the Lord, the Lord tells him to get 70 elders that he knows that are leaders of the people, that he knows that are righteous men and women 
that can lead God's people and take some of this burden. Because Moses says to the Lord, if you don't help me, I can't bear the weight of this people alone. And I want you guys to see the full picture and hear the language that I'm saying. I can't bear the weight of this people alone. And so the Lord says, appoint 70 elders whom have your spirit, bring them to the tabernacle, and I'm gonna show up there at the tabernacle and I'm gonna put the spirit that is on you and I'm gonna put it on them. And so it's taking the burden on one and putting it on a community of, of priests. In verse 25, It says, then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took of the spirit that was upon Moses and placed the same upon the 70 elders. And it happened. That's what I'm praying for. It happened. When the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, although they never did so again. But there's a little tiny story here that I want to read. Verse 26, but two men had remained in the camp. The name of one was Eldad and the name of the other was Medad. It's the names of our next two sons, babe. And the spirit rested. (laughs) Ellen, me. There you got nicknames right there. And the spirit spirit rested upon them. Now they were among those listed, but who had not gone out to the tabernacle, yet they prophesied in the camp. So Eldad and Medad are prophesying. The spirit rests on them. The others leave and they're standing in the the camp prophesying, just these two men. And a young man ran and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, comes up to Moses. We all know who Joshua is. And he he says, Moses, my Lord, forbid them. You got to think, they've never seen this before. They've seen uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. They know that. They know that God talked to Abraham. They know that God called Moses to deliver them from Egypt. So they're they're not thinking like the elders, like we don't know what God is doing. He just took 70 of us and he's anointed them and put Moses' spirit on them. Like you got to think from the people's perspective. So all they see is these two guys who they know who are among them prophesying in the camp. So Joshua's like, but you know, he doesn't know what to do. And Joshua goes and tells Moses, forbid them. And I love Moses' response. And this is, I feel, what the Lord is singing over us today. He's singing over us in this season. He's singing over our, our church. He's singing over his people. And Moses, because the reality is, is that people love to follow. And I'm not saying it's bad to follow. It's actually biblical order to follow. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. But we think that in following that, mean, that is a, um, an excuse to not let what God put in us to come out. And we sit back and watch, which following has nothing to do with watching. So verse 29, Moses responds to Joshua and says, are you zealous for my sake? Like, why are you acting like this? Are you doing this for me? Oh, that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. And Moses returned to the camp, he and the elders of Israel. I believe that the Lord is inviting all of us higher. Not not so we can have some gift or some ministry. He's He's inviting us higher to do something he's never done before. They've never seen men like this prophesy, only the patriarchs. And maybe some priests do the work of the temple, but they've never seen men like this prophesy the spirit of God being upon them before. I believe we are coming to a day that which we haven't seen or heard is about to be manifest. I love this. The word Eldad, it means God has loved. Eldad means God has loved. And Medad means to love. It's, it's the, the giving of love, the expression of love. And so the only reason I want us to, the only thing I want us to say on this, to meditate on this, is the two that were identified to continue to prophesy in the camp were those that God has loved and also love recognize that God has loved and also I will love. Nothing started. So we talked about gifts 
an anointing a few weeks ago, and I believe that with all my heart, and we're going to go after it. Somebody say amen. amen. The word says to it's a good thing to desire the gifts, but we're going to read that it's a sounding brass and a clanging cymbal if we don't have love. So we have to get this principle down before we can move forward into any experience of operating in gifts. To any experience of operating ministry, this has to be it. And so many times ministries, maybe even successful ones by the world's standards, they never operate in love. They operate in ambition and it's disguised as love. And that's why ministries don't work together. And that's why at the root of it, we really want to have our own thing. And we're using the church, the ministry, the, the time to serve God as a temporary passing until he has something else for me. It's a subtle thing. Like he has my ministry. I'm going to serve until he reveals to me what else. Maybe there's nothing else for you to do. Maybe he's called you to serve. Don't think about the next thing. I'm going to be a part of this church. I'm going to be a part of this ministry. I'm going to, I'm going to serve on this team and that team. I'm going to love until it's my time. Does anyone else struggle with this? It's just me. This is, this is, this is real. This is ever. And listen, if you say that this is not creeped in your head, it's you're lying to yourself because self, the heart of man is deceptive. The heart of man is, is wicked. The word says the heart of man is going after self. And so that's why Jesus said to deny yourself and take up your cross. And so he's removing us from the season of, like, what if when we actually came together as a body, like this is a weird concept, the next church or the next ministry, or the next move of God that comes along, we don't jump on that bandwagon. And I'm not saying that that's, I'm not saying that's wrong. Please hear my heart. If the Lord calls you out to something else, the Lord's calling you out. Please go. We don't want you. <laughs> if the Lord's calling you, you know, please. But what I'm saying is let's not look for it. Like, can we steward what God has given us? Can we steward the time that God has given us and not look for the next thing? Can we actually be a part of something that's bigger than ourselves? Can I be honest? When, when the Lord told me to serve my brother and to stop what I'm doing and to serve my younger brother, my ministry, and this is not pointing fingers at myself because I'm going to be honest and be... Um, I'm just going to show you what went through my, my first thought is, well, what about my ministry? And it wasn't like, it wasn't like a horrible thought, but that was the first thing of like, I've served my father's ministry for years. What about the fruits of that? I'm just going to go be on a pastoral team and be on this guy's, like be there's this guy named Tanner. And like actually have to collaborate and be a team. <laughs> but what is that? It's the self that needs to be eradicated because my love was not big enough to comprehend that maybe God is perfecting his body by this bond of perfection called love. And I love the Lord enough. I love my brother enough. I love my family enough to serve without any motivations, to love without maybe getting anything in return. Because the reality is, is that when we text people and they don't text back, and for those of you that have my number, I'm a horrible texter backer and I'm very sorry, but I, it, I love you guys. It's not because I don't love you. You got to understand there's 300 other people texting me. So it's not that I don't love you, but what is it based on? Is, is our love, is our union based on how many times I take you to lunch? Is it based on how many times we get coffee? How many times I text you back? Because Jesus says that do, un, do to others as you would want them to do to you. And we would all say that's a good, uh, you know, that's the golden rule. Praise God. But they say that in the business world. But Jesus said it. So I'm not taking that away. Jesus said it. But he said, this is the law and prophets. And then, he come, and then he comes on and he says, here's a new commandment I give you, that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul, and that you love your neighbor as yourself. And he made a cross in the spirit. And he crossed the two together. There's not one without the other. 
And he said, on these two, hang all the law and prophets. So he took every law, every prophecy of the Old Testament, and he crucified it on the cross with his love. He said, these are my commandments. If you follow this, you will fulfill every commandment. If you follow this, you'll be in my will. If you follow this, you'll be in my house. If you follow this, you'll know where to go. And we're always asking God to speak to us. And what do I do? And where do I go? And what's going on? And what is my purpose at all? Follow the cross. To love your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your soul, and your neighbor as yourself. And in that cross section is what we bear when we deny ourselves, deny yourself and bear your cross. That despite what they do to you, we're going back to the Old Testament. Despite what someone says to you, or if they don't return your love, we're going back to the Old Testament. There's no return needed in love. It's a giving. Someone say giving. It's a pouring. It's a pouring. It's a pouring. <clears throat> Somebody say amen. So, when Jesus hung on the cross as the highest possible expression of love, he fulfilled every law and every Old Testament prophecy. Like Pastor Williams said, we need to read the Old Testament with Jesus' goggles on. He hung on the cross as the highest possible expression of love and fulfilling every law and every Old Testament prophecy. Notice in these two commandments, they have nothing to do with you. <laughs> These two commandments that all the laws and the prophets hang on and hang there is the word. It's the same word. And it says, Jesus hung on the cross, crucified it and fulfilled it. He didn't come to destroy the law, but fulfill the law. The only thing that can fulfill the law is love. So it was love's highest expression, him bleeding and dying on a cross for us who were still sinners. And he says, everything hangs on these two principles. And I think we've done the first one, or at least we think we've done the first one pretty good. And there is a reality of loving the person next to that I want us to tap into the, the power of it. There are so many questions that I get asked as a pastor that if I were to tell you the answer, you would get mad at me because it's like, I love, there's one, <laughs> there's one meme of SpongeBob. How many of you remember SpongeBob? <laughs> And it cracks me up every time. And it's like when, you're, when your Christian friend tells you something like super serious and you say, I'll pray about it, bro. And he's like throwing the confetti. <laughs> and that's what I feel sometimes because people want this like, this extravagant, pastoral, deep answer. And I think so much of our answers would come by, are we loving our neighbor? Like even that sounded kind of like children's churchy. Are you loving your neighbor? Do you walk in love? How often do you think about those around you? That's why I'm talking about recognition because we get so caught up in self and Monday through Friday, it's, it's enjoying self, it's, uh, it's um, building self, it's, it's building our business and that's all good. It's, it's doing the things, it's improving ourselves. it's going to the gym for ourself, it's, it's studying so we have a word so we don't look like an idiot. It's all for ourself. How many times have we been at home and actually thought of another? And I'm not saying never, I know it happens, but I, I feel like if we get engaged, like if I get more engaged with what is going on in your house, you get engaged with what is going on in my house to a degree. If we get engaged of what is God doing in, in my neighbor's life? What is God doing in Jonathan's life and Carissa's life? What is God doing in Liz's life? And the expression of love begins to take place in the recognizing of how important the person sitting next to you is to God. And the recognition of love begins to take place when we understand that if we say we love God with all our mind, with all our heart, and with all our soul, we do not if we do not fully love the person next to us. And sometimes I feel like the Lord would rather us just walk in love than do the big ministry thing. Like, I mean, this is going to be edgy, but I feel like there are some parents that you need to go out and sit on the floor and play blocks with your kids and not read the Bible one morning. 
because it's a religious fil- fulfillment that we think we are going to attain some love of God if we read a chapter. Where our kids are neglected. We think we're something spiritual. Be a mom. Be a dad. I'm not saying don't study. I'm not saying don't be with the Lord. I'm saying love your children the way Jesus does. Being absent is not loving them. Wake up before they do and read your Bible. Be present. And I'm not saying if you've got to go to work, please go to work for the love of God. <sighs> I just got to qualify that. We want to be responsible. But how are we loving? How do you spend your mental energy? <laughs> like, do we spend our mental energy improving our life or giving our life? How do you spend, I'm asking, how do you spend your mental, think about it, don't respond. <laughs> think, please God, don't respond. <laughs> do, we, do we spend our mental energy improving this? Or giving. Love's expression is giving. And I'm not even talking about money. It's giving of ourself, giving of our time, giving of our emotions, giving of whatever it is. It's giving it away. God demonstrated his love for us in this, that he died for us when we were yet sinners. The greatest demonstration is he gave his whole life. And the requirement is we walk in nothing less. He said, The two commandments are to love your God and to love one another as yourself. The second one, he said, the second one is exactly like the first one. Read it, Matthew 22. Matthew 22. Matthew 16, 24 to 25. Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny, say deny himself. That means to forget or lose sight of himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life, his life will lose it. And whoever desires to lose his life for my sake will find it. This is love. Love is the process of carrying your cross despite how you feel or what you are going through. I'm going to say it again. The process of carrying your cross despite how you feel and what you are going through This is what it means to deny yourself. This is what it means to love like Jesus is carrying the cross of the two commandments that fulfilled all the 400 and whatever of the Old Testament. You guys with me? It's two commandments now. Say two. There's there's a witness in the earth now. And until this witness in the earth of these commandments of God begin to take place, his body will not be assembled. And it starts with denying self. How much of my mental capacity Monday through Saturday is on me? Just ask yourself. This is not a condemning. I've been convicted by this. Like, am I really walking in love? Like when I don't feel, can I be honest? My wife said I can be honest, so I'll be honest. There are some weeks where I am inundated by meetings and phone calls and all I want to do is go home and take a nap. (laughs) Is that okay? Like, I'm going to be honest. You know, we, we, we pretend we're something we're not like, uh, you know, but I know that the person on the other side of that phone that is making an appointment or making a meeting or coffee, whatever it is, this is just an example. They need me there. And so if I reject, and not that I'll never cancel a meeting, so don't hold me to that. But if I reject, am I walking in love? I'm making it about me. And how much do we go about planning our life about me? It's so subtle. It's so, and we we clothed it with words of wisdom. And we call, it, we call it wisdom. We call it, I need to rest. We call it all these things. And I'm not saying to strive. I'm saying, let's change the way we think and put our, our love, give it expression to a destination that is beyond what's going on in our life. That if I have, if my love, like Jesus's love was toward us, if my love is toward my neighbor, how strong would the body be? Like imagine if we had churches that actually worked together. 
Imagine if we had ministries that actually ran together, pastors that actually loved another enough to not say, I have a word, I'm really good at preaching, and I win, and we clothed it with spirituality. I would be doing the body a disservice to not deliver what God has put in me, and that is true. But we're still, it's still clothed in self because it's gotta be my ministry. It's gotta be my calling. It's gotta be my thing. Are you guys with me? It says Ephesians 4, read all of Ephesians 4 every single day. It says we are to bear one another in love. That's to carry one another. That means to make up for the deficiency of carrying. There are some among us that can't carry their own life. Are you guys with me? They can't carry their own problems. They can't carry their own afflictions. Whatever we go through, we can't carry it on our own. And you are making up the strength for where they lack. Loving another is being the, we- the strength of God to someone else's weakness. It's not, just, it's not just a verse. How is God our strength in time of weakness? He sends us those that can be our strength. And it doesn't mean you have to be strong. It means you have to love. It'll make you strong. Does this make sense to anybody? He didn't say abide in your love in John 15. He said abide in my love. And so it has nothing to do with you really. It has nothing to do with how you feel and how they're towards you. And if our personalities mesh up and, and if they do this, I'll do that. And if, if I text them and they don't text me back, well, I'm not texting them anymore. And, and it's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop pouring because they stop pouring. That's your love. Your love has limits. His doesn't. What would, ha- what would happen is if we walked as a body in limitless, perfect love, the world would change. It's, it's the culmination of it all. That's what it's going to come to. John 14, 21, Jesus says, he who has my commandments, these two commandments, and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and make myself manifest to him. That is demonstrating to set together. I'm going to love him, and I'm going to make my life manifest to him. Noah, if you can help me. I'm going to make Noah come up here to make you guys think that I'm almost done. John 13. Just kidding. No, we're almost done. John 13 through 30, 13, 34 to 35 says, a new commandment I give you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you, if you have love for one another. So what is the indication of being a disciple of Jesus? How, how good of a preacher you are, the prophetic words you get, how much time you spend in the word, how much time you spend in prayer, doesn't say any of that. It says, by this, you are my disciples if you love one another. So Father, let our love for one another increase. Let the motivation of self be removed from our hearts and our minds today. This is my commandment, John 15, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love, greater love has no one than this. No greater love than this to lay down one's life for his friends. Again, giving. It's the giving, which is the finish line, the culmination, the fulfillment, the final expression, the greatest expression of love. It has to end with giving. The husband and wife are intimate. No children in here. Giving. You guys get what I'm saying? Praise God. All right. Romans 13, 10. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. There is no other laws anymore. There's two. Someone say two. Let's study these two laws. So we've made it much more complicated than it has to be. We've made following Jesus all these rules and regulations. And a lot of times we've rewritten the law that has already been fulfilled. And I'm not saying don't have convictions and don't have devotion. We need all that. I'm saying we've made our walk with the Lord and with each other so much more difficult than it is. And we've, and we've made it about doing stuff for each other that fulfills something in me. What about doing something for a neighbor that doesn't fulfill anything in me, that doesn't advance me in any way, 
It doesn't help me in any way. Even when we give in the offering, I'm going to give so I'm, I'm blessed. We're not giving with the right heart. Yes, he'll bless you. That's the principle. But what the heart is, it's love. I'm going to give to my wife only because I'm praying secretly that she has a gift for me. What is the motivation of our love? What is the motivation of our relationships? <clears throat> Colossians, just go to Colossians really quick. Colossians 3.12. You guys there? Still hear a lot of flipping. The first 12 verses of Colossians speak to who we are. He's, he's talking about who we should be, that we put off the old man, put on the new man, that our life is hidden with Christ. We've learned all that, that Christ be all in all. And then verses 12 to 17, he talks about how to put that into action. We talked about the works of faith. And so here's some practical things that we need to get back to. So he's, he's saying, you're all these things. You have the mind of Christ. Just put on the new man according to the image of him who created him. Therefore, say therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. Starts there. We have to know that we are the elect of God, holy and beloved. We can't love without the recognition of how much we are loved. So it starts there. So if you're still in that place, it's okay. Get the revelation of how much he loves you. Study and search and pray and search after for a deeper revelation of this love because we can't go anywhere if we don't have that, right? Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long suffering, bearing one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above, above all things, put on love. Say, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which you were called in one body and be thankful. So you're called to this body that is put together, joined together, assembled together by this bond of perfection, this completion of love. Love is completed when we give it. I said love is completed when we give it. That's the perfection of love. It's the highest expression, giving what you are to somebody else with nothing, no motive of return. It's the perfection of love. It's how love is completed. He demonstrated his love in us, that he gave his life for us. Let the word of Christ, verse 16, dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord and whatever you do in word and deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Somebody say amen. Now flip to 1 John. It's just a couple books. <clears throat> We're going to start in chapter 3 and verse 16. You guys there? 1 John 3, 16. By this we know love because he laid down his life for us and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. 
And by this we know that we are the, of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments. These two commandments. He's not talking about the laws of Moses. It's two commandments. And do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Chapter four, verse seven says, Beloved, beloved, let us love one another for love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God for God is love. In this, the love was manifest toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. So the fact that Jesus lives in us is the greatest demonstration of love. That we are the, like I opened with, the destination of love. We have to get this revelation that our oneness is the highest expression of love we could have. There's nothing else you have to do. You have it. I said, you have it. He's living in you. He's in you and he's living and breathing and moving. He's given you all things that pertain unto his life and godliness. Let's keep reading. Beloved, if God so loves us, we ought to love one another. <clears throat> Pastor Landry opened pre-service prayer with that. Verse 17. Love has been perfected, and read this whole chapter on your own time, but love has been perfected among us in this. There's a colon there, meaning it's about to give a definition of the perfection of love. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. That word judgment, all that means is in the day of separation. And I believe that we are coming to a day of being separated, being set apart like Chad prophesied, being separated from things that don't belong to us, mindsets that don't belong to us, people that are bad influences that don't belong to us. God is setting a generation apart to understand and grasp the value, the enormity, the glorious, the, the glory of this love. Love has been perfected. That means love has been made whole. Love has accomplished. Love has been fulfilled. Love has been made complete among us. That's in us in this. Like we've read it so many times. Hear what the word is saying. Love has been fulfilled in this, that we would have boldness. That word means to speak boldly, to open your mouth and speak boldly. In the day of separation, God is separating the wheats and the tares. God is separating those that love and don't love. God is elevating like the Eldads and the Medads in this room, those that love God and love others. He is separating and it's been completed in this because as he is, so are we in this world. People think that Jesus is just going from subject to subject here. But love is, as he is, so are we in this world. The fact that we are like him in this world means that love reached on the cross and through his resurrection, the greatest expression. And he gave us everything that had to do with himself. And he said that you may have boldness, that you may speak it out in the day of separation. For as I am now, you are now in this world. If we don't come to this recognize, recognition, the realization, I say, my wife says I say it wrong, realization of love, the love of God, this everlasting love that he didn't pour on us, even though he did, but we stepped into what had already been. And so I pray that we can get a revelation of the love of God that as he is, so are we in this world that doesn't happen without him giving us everything. So it makes me love him more that he gave me everything. It makes me love others more that he gave me everything because my life is not my own anymore. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. And the life I now live in by faith, I live by the faith 
of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So until we deny self, until we understand that our life is hidden with Christ, that we've been crucified with Christ, and so the fact that I'm living, that I'm breathing, that I'm speaking right now is Christ manifest. Is that okay to say? I didn't say Jesus Christ. I said Christ manifest, a many-membered body called Christ. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. So I can experience Christ here right now. I may have a gain of taking off the tent because I won't be constricted by this flesh anymore, but I'm living Christ now. I'm living in heaven now. I'm living in heaven now. I'm living as the body of God, the body of Christ now, the kingdom of God in the earth now. His righteousness in the earth now. And the fact that I can come to this conclusion, it all started from a heavenly father brooding, moving in heavenly places with love. I've loved you with an everlasting love. And by loving kindness, I've drawn you. I've died and rose from the dead for you. I've implanted my life in you. I've given you my word. I've given you my seed. I've given you my life. I've given you everything that pertains unto life and godliness. There should be none of you left. Now go with my life. Go with my love, my ambition. Go with my uh, attitude, my personality, my anointing, and go love another. Because as he is, so are we in this world. That is the perfection of love. Breaking through. I need us to grasp this. That when we don't love another, we are not living the life that God has called us to live. I don't care how anointed you are, how rich you are, how famous you are, how many people come to your meetings. I don't care. I don't care if you pull people out of wheelchairs. I don't care. That's great, praise God, that he had mercy and he did that and the gifts are without repentance. But if you don't have love, you're nothing. I don't care because love, until it is perfected, his body cannot be assembled because it's the bond. Until this love is perfected and his love is perfected of the recognition of my oneness with him. So if I don't recognize how much he loves me, can't recognize how much I can love somebody else. And it's going to cast out all fear. Verse 19, verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. See, sometimes we're afraid to love because we don't think it's going to be reciprocated. It's going to cast all that fear out because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, verse 20, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must also love his brother also. Somebody say amen. Ushers, can we get the um, communion? I want, to do, I want to take communion and then we'll be done. Just turn to 1 Corinthians 13. I think it's fitting we're going to end there. 1 Corinthians 13. Someone make sure Noah gets one, Troy. You got one, okay. All right, we're gonna do this fast, okay? I, I wanna, I wanna pray into something. And I'm gonna read this before we do. Actually, let's start in, in chapter twelve. Verse 31. So, verse 
chapter 12 is what I just quoted. It's about, it's about the unity of the body. It's about many gifts, the manifestation of the spirit given to one for the profit of all. It's about dis- that God composes the body. He composes it by apostles and prophets and teachers. He gives to the body that we are members individually, but the body of Christ. You guys have read this chapter. Yes. He talks about gifts and gifts of healing and all these things. And in verse 31, it says, it's good to desire. Earnestly, he says, desire the best gifts. And yet I show you a more excellent way. Verse thir- chapter 13, though I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but not have love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal, just noise. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Been in a lot of meetings, just being honest, not here, thankfully, or anyone connected to us, thank thank God, or we wouldn't be, well, I shouldn't say we wouldn't be connected because I just preached about that. Uh, We should be connected. I just wouldn't have them preach, okay? They could be connected here. Uh, See, I'm tell- it's for me too. Praise the Lord. We're working through it. But it's just noise. I've been in a lot of meetings and you get goosebumps because it's powerful. No, and it's the, the orator is articulate. The speaker is articulate. The worship is phenomenal. ACDC was phenomenal, but it's not worship. Metallica, whatever. You know what I mean? Like they can play really well. It's not worship. You get goosebumps. And to God, it's noise because we're operating not in love. It's the foundation by which we must operate in the kingdom of God. You can't do anything without it. And if you do, God says noise. And we could do things and say things with a verbiage of come Lord Jesus come and a house for him. If we don't have love, it's just noise. He doesn't care about the verses that you quote. He wants you to love the one sitting next to you. So I pray today that we can love our neighbor better. We can love our wife better, our husband better. Come on, we can love our children, our families, that we can be a better example of love to our community. Unfortunately, if you would ask a lot of people in Keller, which, which one of, of your coworkers are Christians and which ones are not, you can't really tell. I went and bought a car a few weeks ago. The sales guy came out, he dropped four F-bombs in the first three sentences. And, you know, I was like, I didn't think about it. I'm like, whatever, you know, yeah. Just talking to him and being nice to him. And then I do the application and I have to put occupation. And this is always fun. Pastor. And you could see him change. He's like, well, what church do you go to? I'm like, oh, it's called Risen Nation Church. He's like, I'm a Christian too, brother. Like, all right. (laughs) We come to our church one time and we can, the spirit of cussing out of you. Uh, I'm not saying he's not a, Christian or whatever. But what what I'm saying is, does anyone actually know among you, like people you work with? Like, are we, are we showing the love of God? Sometimes the, the people that behave the worst are the Christians and that act most like the world and love the least and are the most arrogant are Christians. Sometimes the hardest people to work with in the business world are Christians. I'm not saying, I'm saying what's true, okay? Like, we're either going to talk about it or we're not going to talk about it. But he's called you to be the light of the world. Kindles that light, that flame, this love. There's no, there's no, no other way to operate. So if I have all the faith that I could remove mountains, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but not have love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Listen, don't 
read this or hear this, like every wedding they read this at, and you know, boyfriends write this to their girlfriends in high school. This is not what I'm talking about, okay? Read the word and what it is saying. Let it carve you. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. Lord, engrave your love in us. Love does not seek its own. It's not provoked. It thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things. Like, can we believe, love enough to believe? What somebody says is true, even though they've lied 10 times to us that I'm gonna love you enough to continue to believe you because I abide in his love, not mine. If I abided in my love, you'd all be up a creek. But his love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. I believe and I hope the best for my neighbor, for myself, for my children. It endures all things. Love never fails. Whether there are prophecies, they'll fail. Tongues will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will fade away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect, love is perfect, has come, then that which is in part will be done away when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, when I became mature, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as also I am known. And now abide faith, hope, and love. And these three, but the greatest of these is love. Somebody say amen. We see in part, we prophesy in part, we understand in part. But when the perfection has come, the recognition of he gave himself, love is perfected in this, that Christ is in me, the hope of glory. Love is perfected in this because he, as he is, so are we in this world. If he gave his life for me and lives in me eternal, we should give our life for our neighbor. Love is perfected in the giving of it. Love is completed in the giving of it. We were the target, the destination, the bullseye of God's everlasting love. And he created man in it. He didn't just create you and loved you. He created you in his love. And so I believe this morning, as we stand to our feet, and we're gonna take some communion, <clears throat> When it says face to face, that we will see him face to face, what that means is there's no veil. So I believe that the Holy Spirit is gonna remove all veils this morning. And the veil of the word speaks of the flesh. It's, it speaks of self. So I believe that God is gonna remove the veil of self this morning. Say amen. God is gonna remove the veil of self this morning. 2 Corinthians 3, 18, but we all with unveiled face. Some translations say with open face. Looking in the mirror, beholding the glory of the Lord in a mirror are changed into the same image from glory to glory. So Father, in Jesus' name, as every hand is lifted, Lord, we pray that the veil of self would be removed this morning. That the veil of self-motivation, that the veil that consumes us of our life, our ministry, what's going on in our world, that you would remove the veil this morning, that we may see you face to face, that we may see love itself this morning, face to face. I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that as we take eat your flesh and drink your blood this morning, that you remove all veils of bitterness, that you remove all veils of insecurity, that you remove all veil of doubt, that you remove all veil of lack, all the veils of shame and condemnation, that you remove the veil of offense in this house of every life, that you remove the veil of everything that tries to hinder love that we may see you face to face, Lord. We are not after you in part. We want the fullness of who you are. 
You said to ask and we will receive. So we are asking in your name that you remove every veil, Jesus, that we may see the fullness of who you are. We want to see you face to face. We want to look at you with unveiled face. Beholding in a mirror the glory of the Lord. There's so many of us that are trying to behold in the mirror with a veiled face. Remove the veil today, I pray in Jesus' name. Lord, as we drink your blood, I pray that you cleanse us from old pathways of thinking, from old mindsets, Lord, that you cleanse us, God, from where we have been, that you wash us by your blood, Jesus, that you teach us, Lord, your new commandments that we are to love God with all of our heart, mind, and soul and love our neighbor as ourselves. Cleanse us, Lord, of all impurities, all the impurities of self today, that we may deny ourselves and carry our cross. Wash us, Lord. Wash me today, Jesus. Help us to walk in love, think in love, dwell in love, abide in love, that the world may know. Go ahead and partake. And this, your body, I pray, as we can consume you this morning, that your life would overtake our life, that your mind would overtake our mind, that your thoughts would overtake our thoughts, that the quality and the kind of human being that you were when you walked this earth, Jesus, that we would be. Thank you, Lord, for your word, that love has been perfected, completed, made whole in this, that as you are, we are the same in this world. Let the life of our flesh, let the life of our human being right now, Lord, take over our mortal flesh, I pray, as we deny self, that the life that we now live, we live by the faith of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Let that truth revolutionize our thinking today. In the mighty name of Jesus, overtake our mortal flesh. In Jesus' name, partake. I want you guys to hold hands. If your neighbor's hand is sweaty, it's the anointing. And I want to pray. Can we pray together? I need you guys to agree with me because I believe that the Lord is, is breaking. He's breaking up our fallow ground. Forgive us, Jesus, for what we've made it. Forgive us, Lord, for what we've made this walk to be, this life to be. Forgive us, Father, for having self being at the front of our motivation, self being at the front of our consciousness. Teach us, Lord, to love these people we are holding hands with the same way that you love them. Father, let it not be our love, but let it be your love, God. This selfless, devoted love that gives, that the perfection of love is how we give our life. So we commit, God, in the mighty name of Jesus that we will give of ourselves to our neighbor the way that you gave us so freely, that we would demonstrate the love of God by in how we give and how we love. That the way your love was demonstrated toward us, that you gave your only begotten son, we demonstrate and commit to demonstrate your love for this person to the left and the right of us. I pray, Lord, that in this place would be the greatest unlocking, the greatest revealing of the anointing of God that this house has ever recognized in Jesus' mighty name. That in this place of love, that we would come to the greatest encounters, the greatest experiences, the greatest revelation that we have ever seen in the mighty name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for a people that love first and prophesy second, but I thank you when the prophecy comes, Lord, it would be more edifying than ever before, more accurate than ever before, that a people that walk in the giftings like this world has never seen because we are rooted in love and grounded in love. 
I pray that you increase their finances, God, that you increase their health, their wealth, that you strengthen them, give them peace, Lord. Make Risen Nation Church so extraordinary and set apart, Father. Consecrate your people, Lord. Make us not a church, but a priesthood, Father, that loves, Lord, and help everything we do be built on the foundation of this love. Plant your seed like we heard of love in each and every one of us, Lord, that it may grow, that we may know when the time of refreshing comes, when revival comes, when the Holy Spirit is revealed, it is with more power, more demonstration of the kingdom of God, more velocity, more accuracy than we have ever seen because it's rooted and grounded in love. We love you, Lord. We dedicate our lives to serving not only you, but also your bride. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Can we bless God? Come on. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you again for joining us for this podcast. We pray that above all, your life was touched by his presence. If you're interested in learning more about the church or getting plugged in, you can visit us at www.risennation.org or follow us on social media to stay up to date with all that God is doing here. We love you guys. God bless.